Okay, so welcome everyone to the, the coffee chat. Um, I hope everybody's had a good month. Um, for those of you who haven't been here for a while and need reminding and for visitors. So this is a forum where small businesses can share their stories and for others to learn and gain a little bit of inspiration from those stories. And today's chat is about a topic that we get so many questions about. Now, what are the differences between a mentor and a coach? But we're gonna talk about a little bit more about that in a few minutes. So in the past few weeks, we've had quite a few businesses who were quite keen to chat to us and then pull out at the last minute. So I haven't fathomed what the actual reasons are, but I'll try and uh, find out. So if any of you know of any businesses that are struggling and need help or would be keen to share their story with us, then please let me know. Uh, so the more of a pipeline we can build, um, the easier it's gonna be to have a backup plan when somebody pulls out. So now let's briefly share the agenda for today. So we're going to chat to a company called Narrative. Um, they're gonna to talk to us a little bit about mentoring and coaching, and we'll have some Q and A, and then we're gonna wrap up. Now, please post your questions in the chat function, and I'll, I'll, we'll address them after uh, the ladies chat. Now, today, we have a lady by the name of Karen Lee who's going to chat to us from Charlotte in North Carolina, which for those of you who don't know is actually in the USA. And it's half past two in the morning there. So a very big thank you to Karen for staying up and giving up some of her beauty sleep and time and you know, have some time to chat to us. So let me introduce Karen. So I had to, Karen, I had to narrow down your bio because it's quite extensive. Um, so Karen is first and foremost a business strategist and a growth leader. And she's got more than 25 years experience of extensive consulting and organizational leadership expertise. And in 2014, Karen decided to found Narrative. And she leveraged her business background um, and also the fact that she used to work for one of the big five consulting companies. So she brought all that expertise to bear and she delivers real-time or real-world solutions that deliverable, deliver measurable impact on employee satisfaction and retention, cultural transformation, and top and bottom line business profitability. Karen's got a Bachelor of Science in Maths from the University of Carolina, and she's a graduate of the Innovation Institute of the McCall, McCall Center for Visual Arts. So Karen is well-versed in business, and she's going to share with us the differences between mentoring and coaching. So I'm now going to kill the, the slide deck and I'm going to hand over to, to Karen. So Karen, it is all yours. Okay, great. Thank you for having me, everyone. Um, I, can I go ahead and share my screen? By all Richard? means, by all means. Okay, great. So I know that um, all of you could probably give a presentation on your thoughts on mentoring versus coaching and everything. So I do want to make this interactive. Um, I'll get through some of my things, but if you want to interrupt me, that's fine, or we can do questions at the end either way. I wanted to call this rapid fire on coaching and mentoring because you know we could spend all day talking about it and I think I have about 20 minutes. So I'm gonna throw a lot of things out, um, some my thoughts on it. Um, so we'll get started. I'm gonna talk about coaching first, then I'll talk about mentoring and hopefully you'll see the difference that I see between the two. And then we'll talk briefly about becoming a coach or a mentor and what to look for in a coach or a mentor. So this is one definition. A coach is someone who sees how great you are and shows that image to you. And I think that's a big part of coaching is, is that um, helping someone see all their potential, right? And, and cheering them on. But specifically, a coach helps someone come up with their own diagnosis of a problem and have them come up with the solution that best fits their approach to work, what motivates them, their experience, et cetera. Um, and they also, coaches provide accountability. So it's a, an accountability partner that someone can um, 
you know, work with. And then the cheering you on part is what the, the quote is talking about. So coaching goes beyond being the expert or diagnosing a problem or providing information. And they may or may not do that at some point, but what they're really doing is teaching someone to fish rather than giving them a fish. Even beyond that, they're also teaching them to diagnose and plan their own fishing approach, right? So it's not the coach telling someone how they would do it, but asking questions and getting them to say, to, to figure out the best approach for them. So the way they do that, the way coaches do that is through powerful questions. And I, I really like um, this, uh, these different categories of questions and that coaches can use them in lots of different situations. So I'm gonna go through each one just briefly. So assessment is really about what is this current situation? Describe the current situation. Um, what have you tried before? Uh, let's assess the situation. The what ifs are, you know, what if you had a magic wand and there were no constraints? How would you solve this issue that you're talking to me about? Um, these are just some examples. The role play I really like. I really think that's helpful because if I'm talking to a coachee about an issue they're having with their colleague, then we go through that and we're talking about it. And then I say, tell me, if your colleague was sitting right next to you right here today, what do you think they would say about this situation? And what would your boss say about the situation between you and your colleague? So it's getting them to really think from someone else's lens. Plan B is what it says, you know, um, if they've come up with a solution for something and then you say, okay, so let's say that doesn't work out. What's your plan B? So again, this is all about getting the coachee to think of their own solutions. Um, prediction, you know, how do you think that's going to turn out? When you say that to so-and-so, what do you think is going to happen? Or when you do that, take that action, what's going to happen? Evaluation is if you could do something over again, if you could evaluate that situation um, that happened, um, what would you do differently? And then I love the values one as well. The values one, I, I had a coach for 10 years, and then I had another coach for a few years. I told, I told the coach that... Um, I had for 10 years, I told him that I graduated. <laughs> um, but then I had, I had another coach and I now I'm in a group coaching. So I kind of um, walk the talk, you know, I, I have a, I, I think all coaches should have a coach. And he would always ask a lot of times, he would insert my daughter into the conversation and he would say, so tell me, what do you, would you tell your daughter to do something that way? Or what if you told your daughter this was what you were going to do? Would you feel good about it? So it was really that is about kind of the of that it was a values question. I'm happy to send you. I have like four or five to ten questions each on these. If you would like that that resource, I'm happy to send you those. As far as types of coaching, um, these are the four that I think about: performance and development are is when um, somebody might be doing something really well they do they they know their they have their expertise they do their job really well but a lot of times there's that one thing that they have trouble with i'll tell you from my experience a lot of times that issue is interpersonal skills and relationships that they're having and so they may need a coach to help them with that but it could be another another competency that they are having trouble with. From a development standpoint, it could also be a good thing that they're being promoted, they're getting ready to move to the next level, and they need to um, just learn some other things, work on some other things to get there. Skills is specific coaching on things like business development or giving presentations or developing some skill. The executive's agenda, I really, like because that's what I've kind of done. I had before narrative, I had a company that had 11 people and we had three partners. So I had two partners. So the executive's agenda just says, I'm going to come in as a coachee and I'm going to decide what 
what I want to talk to you about my coach, you know, this session. Um, and it may take several sessions, but um, it could be, so for my, in my example, if I had issues with my partners, I'd talk to them about those. If I had issues with an employee, I'd talk about that. Um, we sued a company for stealing our product. So that was a, comp that was a lot of sessions. Um, and so that's what executives agenda is. And that's what a lot of um, people get co are, that are doing coaching, if they're coaching, going for coaching for a long term. And then the fourth one is career coaching. And I do quite a bit of career coaching, um, helping people understand what their strengths are, what they like, what they don't like, um, and match those with possible career areas. So um, I'm sure that you all could probably come up with other types, but those are the main four that I think about. Some other factors, and I threw this picture in here of just a bunch of different things because I'm just gonna talk about a few things that go along with coaching. One thing is who engages and pays that coach. So if I'm coaching an individual and they're paying out of their pocket, it's gonna be confidential between the two of us and um, it's, not, it's pretty straightforward. When a company um, engages and pays a coach from the outside, a professional coach to come in, the manager or leader may have some expectation that they're going to get to talk to the coach about the coaching sessions. You have to be really careful with that. Some coaches will not have any part of that and they will only coach if it's comp totally confidential between the coach and the coachee. Um, as I said though, when there's a performance issue um, and, and there's other times the manager wants some sort of high level, how are things going, what's happening. And so um, you just, you have to kind of negotiate that. And it's all about being very straightforward and open and transparent with everybody involved. So if I do coach someone and the manager's insisting that I do give him some feedback, um, I am very clear with the coachee what that, that entails. So you all might have some conversation, we might have some conversation about that because it's a tricky one. The period of time, you can have one coaching session, you can have three coaching sessions, you can be coached for every two weeks for 10 years like I was. So period of time really, really varies. I have to put in here assessments because assessments are near and dear to my heart. I use a lot of research-based assessments in my work and I have a proprietary narrative big five personality assessment but I use a lot of research-based assessments in my work. And coaches, a lot of times, will use them up front, as I do, to really get up to speed on what, how the um, coachee likes to approach work, what motivates them. It's really, and then also to compare the coach's personality to the coachee's personality to understand, um, you know, how that relationship could work. Another, again, this is a kind of a hodgepodge of, of topics related to coaching. The other thing is building coaching cultures. You hear a lot about that right now within corporations and, and businesses. Um, you know, going back to when I started work, everything was very hierarchical, right? And the boss told his subordinate what to do. That person told their subordinate what to do and how to do it. And now we're, you're seeing companies that are being more progressive and they're talking about building these coaching cultures. And so they're training leaders and managers to be more of a coach. And then Richard asked me about KPIs for coaching and mentoring. And so measuring success, I really, it all goes back to what is the point, what are the objectives of the coaching? What, um, what have you agreed? And it all goes back to expectation, right? So if everybody understands the expectations and the objectives, then you can measure the success as you go along. Okay, now let's talk about mentoring. So I put this definition together as a trusted, experienced guide committed to a relationship and to sharing their knowledge. So whereas a coach is trying to get, asking a lot of questions and getting input from the coachee and what makes sense for them, 
the mentor is doing more of advising based on their experience. And they're providing one perspective. They're providing the mentor's perspective. They may share their network. And they are, like a coach, going to cheer you on. So I got this, these five types of mentors from this ideas.ted.com, and I really like them. The first one's master of craft. So this is what you typically think of when you're um, thinking about a mentor, someone that is in a position that the, the person they're mentoring wants to be in, and that person helps them with how they got there and how they can be successfully get to where they are and be successful. Um, so that's one. The other is champion of your cause. So somebody that advocates for you and that may kind of introduce you to their network and be a connector. That's what the champion of your cause might be. A co-pilot is a peer mentor that you might collaborate with. An anchor is one of those that it's a confident, it's a sounding board. So you might be venting to this, this person about all the, the obstacles you're going through. And then this reverse mentor is especially important in this multi-generational workforce. You know, we've got baby boomers, generation X, Y, Z, and you know, baby boomers and generation X can learn a lot from generation Z. So it's just that point of remembering that the mentor doesn't have to be that really experienced person because you know, for example, Generation Z knows a lot about social media and uh, technology that the rest of us can learn. The other thing I wanted to point out about mentoring is that it, it goes across a spectrum from really informal to formal. So you can have on the left side the organic relationship that, that um, comes together, and it's never even named as a mentoring relationship, but that's really what it, what it is, right? Then you've got more casual and they may call, the mentee may call the mentor mentor, um, but it's still casual. And then you've got a lot of volunteer mentors, um, especially in the nonprofit world, there'll be mentors that are older and more experienced working with young children and with young adults. And then on the right hand side, the other end of the spectrum, you have more formal programs like in a corporation or, or a, a medium sized business where the mentor and the mentee are assigned to each other. Um, when I was at Accenture, I was an associate partner at, um, towards the end. And I, as a new associate partner, I was assigned a mentor that was, had been an associate partner for several years. This was a year long program. They spent a lot of money on it. They flew us to see each other. We weren't living in the same town. You know, they had conferences with all the mentors and mentees that came together. And um, so it's a very formal program. So I just think it's interesting. It can be very, very informal to very formal. Now you all, some of you on, on the, the um, program may know how to become a coach and more information than I do. But right now, you know, anyone can put out a shingle and be a coach. And there are a lot of coaches out there. Now to be, uh, more credible and to have that certification and training. The International Coaching Federation is a large organization, really well known. Um, they do provide training and levels of certification and accreditation, but they also will accredit training, other training programs on coaching. So if you decide to become a coach and you decide to get a, a certification credit, accreditation, then I would, um, if not go to the International Coaching Federation, at least go to a program that has been accredited by them. And then a mentor, you just have to find a mentee um, and have something to share with them and be willing to share. So um, it's less structured. I'm sure there's a few, there's some training courses and things, and especially in those volunteer they generally have some kind of training, but it's, it's much less extensive than a coaching program. And the last thing I wanted to talk about was how, what do you look for in a mentor or coach? And these are just my ideas, but again, you all may have some other ideas. Um, chemistry is one as a coach and all the coaches that I know, they offer a 
one or two conversations up front to make sure that there is a fit as far as the coaching relationship goes. And um, approachability, you know, the coachee needs to feel comfortable approaching uh, the coach with almost anything. And then I think a good listener. Because again, in order to d decide which questions to ask, you have to be a really good listener. And you're, again, you're asking a lot of questions and getting input from them. This is more about look what you look for in a good coach than necessarily a mentor. I think a mentor might have some a little bit different. So that's what I wanted to share with you. Um, I'm happy to take any questions or hear any thoughts that you all have. Thanks, Karen. Um, I think I'm going to start the ball rolling. I've actually got three questions. Okay. So the first one is, <clears throat> to what depth should a, a coach go to? To you know, what so depth? Yeah, you know, if you're a subject matter expert um, or in a specific area and you've been, been hired as a coach, um, uh -huh. to, you know, you, you're supposed to share some experiences um, and try and guide the person to find the solutions themselves. And, but to what depth do you go to? Do you keep it superficial or do you actually climb in and get to the nuts and bolts of a problem? Oh, I mean, I definitely think the, the plan would be to get as deep as you need to go. A lot of times what you're trying to do is make the coachee aware of, of things they, they are not bringing to the surface, that they're not thinking about, kind of the why behind what they're doing, right? Okay. So um, it depends on the situation, but a lot of times you are trying to go further. And, and by asking those questions, that's what you're doing, right? Okay, all right, I get that. So that's what it leads me to my next question, which is how do you actually stop yourself from jumping in and actually solving a problem? You know. Everybody has a, a patience threshold in terms of if you can see, listen, this is what the cause of the issue is. Um, and that no matter how much you're trying to coax that person to come up with a solution, or they just can't see um, the cause, um, how do you stop yourself from actually just jumping in and going sorting it out yourself? So that's a good question and a really difficult thing. And that's why I will say that I think there's certain types of people that make really good coaches because they don't, they are patient and they, they believe in the process so much that they are able to not have that impulse almost, you know, I will tell, I will just be totally honest with you. And I tell my, I, that's why I don't do coaching full time. Coaching is a part of what I do. And I do some career coaching quite a bit, but I struggle with that. So when I, actually talk to people that want me to coach them, I will tell them I'm really a coach slash consultant because I will sometimes give, tell you my experience and I might um, give you some options based on my experience. Um, so it's hard, it's hard for me. Um, but I will tell you that when you go to those, that training, I know people that have been through ICF training, and they feel really, really strongly that you should not do that. Okay. Sort of, that leads me straight to my third question. So you mentioned that you are a consultant slash coach. Um, so where does a consultant fit in between the two definitions in terms of a coach or a mentor, or is a consultant completely outside of that frame? You know, that's a good question. Um, Well, a, cons in a, a consultant in general is, has some kind of expertise, right, that they're bringing to the table. And so they are bringing that, some advice and giving, here's the approach that I would take, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's, it's so interesting because when, when my coach, um, he, he, was, he was trained and he was like a pure coach, but what he would do sometimes is he would actually physically say, okay, because I would ask him. And I know a lot of coaches, they just want, tell me, what, what should I do? <laughs> you know. So sometimes he would say, okay, I'm going to put on my consultant hat 
And he would then give me his thoughts and his advice, and then he'd take off his hat. I mean, that's how clearly he had to delineate being a coach versus a consultant. Okay. All right. Thank, I think I've got my answer there. So does anybody else have any questions for, for Karen? Garth, are you awake? Any, like, you can dispute what I have to say as well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do have a question. I was mulling the question when you thought I was asleep, Richard. Um, <laughs> Karen, um, how does one deal with, uh, and, and my background is consulting largely, and you get, you get potential clients, mainly from the entrepreneurial sort of area that you offer them advice, sound advice based on consulting techniques, models, etc. And yet the entrepreneur in them will say, I continue to go my own way. And one does end up despairing because you can see the pitfalls. You've outlined the red flags for them, yet they continue. How does one deal with that and maintain your composure in the process? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, as a consultant, I, when I advise my clients, and it's happened to me really recently, um, you know, I have these recommendations and they have all these reasons why they can't do it yet. Um, I, they continue to have the same issue and I keep telling them what I would, what they should do. And they just, they, it's usually courage. It's usually they mm -hmm. lack the courage to do it. Mm -hmm. So the mm -hmm. example that I have is I, I had a couple people that I told them I've been with them for two years and I said, you need to let these people go. Mm -hmm. You need to let these two people go and get somebody in that can do this, this, and this, but they just mm -hmm. don't have the courage. And it's frustrating. Mm -hmm. It's very mm -hmm. frustrating. Yeah. I, I don't have an answer, <laughs> except that I, d I do keep kind of going back, mm -hmm. but you have to be careful because there's only so many times that you can tell someone. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Anybody else have any solutions to that? It's a tough one. Mm. But I continue to think that I'm still helping them. I know that I could, it could help so much more if they would take some of the big leaps. But then if mm -hmm. they don't, I just continue to try to help them with the smaller leap, you know, the smaller yeah. steps. Yeah. My question was actually going to tie in directly with Goths, but um, are there times where you don't have a choice and you have to just walk away and say, listen, we tried all we tried. Um, we did all we could do. Yeah. Does that ever happen? Yeah, I, 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 I call it firing a client. So <laughs> okay. I, had to, I had to fire a client uh, in 2019. And because we didn't have the same, they were not open to all the things that needed to happen. You know, I just, I, I couldn't continue to work at it piecemeal if they didn't have that, the, the philosophy to, of being open and um, okay. think, you know, engaging their employees and all mm -hmm. kinds of things. Yeah. Okay. Cool. But I know it's hard. It's hard to do yeah. the fire clients, especially, but, um, but sometimes it, it does get to a place where you don't feel like I'm, I can't help you because uh, you're not listening. Okay. Okay, we've got time for maybe one or two uh, more questions. Kathy. Uh, maybe my question is, is partly related to the last two, but um, what happened, or well, can you give some advice if you find yourself in a, well, ethically in a position where perhaps the person is, I don't know, severely depressed, uh, really um, at a health risk, um, or possibly, you know, breaking the law or doing something illegal, how, I mean, how that must be quite a tricky situation to be in. See it and get the sort of confessions out and you're not a priest or a psychologist. Right, right. So I, um, in, in my coaching, I, all, I have a contract and it's a one page and it's about confidentiality and it's about, but it has a disclaimer on there. 
that if there's any, if at any time I think that they're, they could harm someone or themselves, or I forget exactly how it's worded, but it's basically that's, that's when I will go outside of the confidentiality. Um, so it, fortunately it has not happened to me, but I do know people. So I knew early on to put that disclaimer in. Um, and I also certify people to use my, my uh, personality assessment. So I also, when I'm certifying people, I, you know, when you're talking about people and how they like to approach work, it gets really um, blurry, the personal versus business. Yeah. And so I'm, all, you know, that's part of, we have this whole eth ethics about what to do. You know, you have to be very clear when they go beyond when they're depressed or they talk, start talking about things that they really should talk to a therapist about that you're ready to say, I'm not qualified to talk about this, but I'm happy to give you a reference to someone that you could talk to about it, that sort of thing. And, and in the case where, for example, you've been hired um, by the company to do mentoring or co coaching usually, um, and there's a con, I mean, there's a lot of conflict. So people are often, you know, anti their bosses or speak from experience. They're quite uh, difficult people to work with. And, um, and you can see that bad behavior in the company, but can you really tell the, coachy that uh, you know they should leave because it's such a terrible place or yes yeah, so that is, all, that is always the um that's where that issue between who 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 is who are you working with are you working with the coachy or are you working with the manager um and there is always that chance that when i coach someone especially when it's an issue that somebody that the manager wants me to fix which obviously i'm not fixing them but that's kind of how they're looking at it right um there's always that chance Karen? the person's gonna leave yes sorry just guys we're probably going to get cut off shortly okay. um if we do then just um go back in on exactly the same link sorry no sorry karen no that's fine so um there's always that chance that they're going to leave. And I have conversations with the coachee about, they usually bring it up, but sometimes I will ask, well, you know, if you weren't working here, where, where would you work? What would you want to do? So just that again, it's asking questions, not telling them. Mm. And I do to empathize with them when they have a tough boss, I empathize and you know, but it, yeah, it can, it can get very mm. sticky. I think it can also um, break down the trust. The coach, you might think, well, this this coach is actually working for my manager, and so you know they're trying to change me, or they're trying to reinforce the bad behavior, or whatever it is. And that can be tricky too. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's why ideally it's you and the coach, and they the, the company's investing in the person. And they're yeah. let they let you have a confidential coachy coach relationship, right? That's ideal. Yeah. Yeah. I think you might have to just answer the following question within the next um when we log back in, because I see we have less than a minute left. But I'm curious, is there a way to measure um the growth or how you are actually mentoring or coaching someone that you can measure it? Because I, I can imagine a lot of times clients go, Oh, well, listen, I don't feel you know I'm getting the value that I'm paying for. Kind of thing so how do you approach that maybe we should come back in for that <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i haven't had anybody necessarily question the value because it's just it's a very it's a very tangible thing um and i mean i mean it's not a tangible thing so that's why in my uh, with design as well i often get that where people say oh but you know I can do this easy. I have work. Why do I need you? So it, that's what makes it tricky because it's not tangible. Yes. Yeah. So it depends on what kind of coaching you're talking about. If you're talking about skills coaching, like I'm going to teach you to do business development, it's more of a training. You can kind of measure that career coaching. You know, if they feel like they now have a better idea of what, what areas to go down and they've, they've left with some clear things of how to describe themselves and what they're looking for in a job. You know, it depends. And that's where I said up front, you got to say, what is success? Mm -hmm. You always kind of up front have to have that discussion. Um, as far as fixing an issue um, or a development issue, you know, how, for example, the relationship one. Mm -hmm. A lot of times that depends on how, when they brought me in. If they bring me in soon enough, 
to get them back on track, the relationship. But a lot of times they've waited, you know, it's gone on for years and they're bringing me in as a last resort and it's yeah. tough. It's not necessarily going oh. to. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Cool. Any other questions from anyone? Dana, you are way too quiet. No, I'm listening. I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other questions from anyone for Karen? Nothing. Okay. Great. No, Karen, I've got one. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Go on. Um, when we, and it touches on where Kathy raised her, um, her question earlier. When one does have that emotive um, outburst or loss of control, in a, I, I would refer to it in a consulting context, but where you have a guy and his partner um, bawling their eyes out in, in, a, in a, you know, a consulting environment you've got to sort of turn to some force that's not in the room to say please help me i don't know how to handle this but what is the appropriate action when one takes when a situation does dissolve into a hugely emotive you know issue and how do you deal with that platform because it's something i'm not equipped for and yet it's happened <laughs> and the outcome's been positive but it you know you need counseling after that mm. yeah because when, when you're I know, when you're coaching someone, it's very personal, right? I mean, mm. it's, it, it be, especially if there's um, if the managers brought you in because there's something that they want them to understand and change and that sort of thing. So you know, I've had people in tears, and mm. I just try what I try to do when people are emotional is to try to be very non-emotional but yeah. sympathetic right so compassionate but i just try to be as calm and listen and um it, it usually works out for me uh, yeah. but it's tough to see somebody that's in such pain right mm -hmm. um it's 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 tough mm -hmm. and i okay. i do like i will ask them do you want to take a break do you want to, you know, I try to just be as sympathetic and as human as I possibly can. Yeah. No, great. Thanks. Okay, any other questions? Y'all have some tough questions. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, they're all, I can, every time you, have, you ask one, I come up with my uh, example that I, you know, <laughs> okay, yes. <yeah. laughs> <laughs> okay so okay no other questions so i think we need to just wrap up um one last question kathy Catherine's. Catherine. sorry do, do you do karen do you do any um uh, team coaching so there's there's one-on-one -on -one, but sometimes there's a, you can resolve a relationship between two people um have you ever done any of that are there any specific guidelines yeah so i've done some um i've done some conflict co between two executives when there's conflict and they really want to keep both executives but it's causing trouble among you know the organization essentially um that one i have a very a process that i go through with that conflict and it does involve assessments and understanding usually it's because they're different right and understanding where they're different helping them communicate to each other and then um, coming up with an action plan and and and, and so i have a very a specific process for that conflict resolution. Um, the other, the other thing is, I do talk, work with a lot of entrepreneurs that are partners, and it's not that there's necessarily something bad going on. It's more about, hey, let's, we want to work well together, so let's learn about each other. And so I do some coaching with the the, the two partners, um, and that is great. Now, I do a lot of team training and using assessments it's not necessarily coaching but it it gets into a lot of the the same issues um and they're sharing about themselves and how they like to work and it's so powerful and so you know they they're opening up to each other about um, a lot of things and and 
yeah, but I haven't done, I've, I've thought about doing some group coaching and I'm actually in sort of a group coach now, group coaching scenario, but um, I haven't done a lot of group coaching myself. Teach, you know, being the coach and having a group of, together at one time. But the partner thing I do quite a bit. Thanks. Any other questions? No, okay. Karen, thank you so much for this and for giving up some of your beauty sleep to talk to us. Um, I personally found it fascinating and answered a lot thank of my you. questions. Um, but Garth and I actually do a lot of work together and I think we do a little bit of mentoring, a bit of, a bit of coaching, a lot of consulting um, and shy away from any sort of conflicts. Um, but I think, yeah, we've got a bit of work to do there and a little bit of research to do. See, you know, because one or two of the engagements that are coming up, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of conflict that we're going to have to navigate. Mm -hmm. But again, thank you so much uh, for giving so, up your time. I enjoyed it. Sure, I'd be. Lo I'd love to come back and talk about assessments or talk about my conflict resolution process. So I enjoyed okay. it. Thank you for Wonderful. having me. Thank you so much. Thanks, Catherine. Thank Hey guys, I will do the usual. I'll be posting the video on uh, YouTube and I will include Karen's email on the or her email address on the email links. So if you have any questions, then by all means, you can talk directly to Karen or you can send it to me and I will forward it through. Um, I just need to figure out how to get the two videos together, but I'm sure I'll get that right. Um, and I'll edit the thing. I hope it hasn't disappeared. But anyway, other than that, I hope you guys enjoy your weekend. Uh, Karen, you can sleep in nice and late tomorrow. Yeah. Or today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, guys. Enjoy your weekend. Right. Cheers, Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks, Karen.